If two criminals arrived at your doorstep in the middle of a brutal storm and began to dismantle your entire life, what would you do? Bad things happen to good people, and bad people, and psychotic people. In the highlands of Scotland, a family sitting down for a birthday celebration suddenly find themselves the unwitting caretakers of a pair of fugitives who are happy to use violence to solve their problems. But laying down without a fight isn't this family's way, and they have a bevy of secrets of their own that they'll go to insane lengths to protect. They'll need to start making smarter choices if anyone hopes to make that alive when the storm breaks. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the menagerie of killers in Little Bone Lodge. On a dark and stormy night, a family prepares to hunker down as the wind thrashes and rain pelts the ground in heavy sheets. Mama Rose and Maisie prepare a birthday cake for Pa, who's wheelchair bound. He's barely responsive when the girls take pictures with him and blow out his candles. But when there's a sudden ring at the door and a man screams for help, he seems to wake up. Whether he's worried or excited is unclear. Mama goes to the door. The guy outside tells her they were in a brutal car wreck on the nearest road. With the storm, the only place to go was this house in search of a phone. But she tells him there isn't one. He's dragged his brother all the way and begs her to open the door. She makes a split-second decision and lets the boys inside. Side. The injured one has a deep cut on his head, broken ribs, and a piece of rebar impaling his abdomen on the right side. She and Maisie get him on the kitchen counter for a little triage. Oh god. When I pull it out on three, you have to apply extra pressure. Mm. She learns the guy going manic in the corner is named Matthew. She reassures him his brother Jack will pull through with a confidence that doesn't belong around anyone with a six inch bar lodged in their liver. Before even cleaning the blood off of his face, Matthew washes off a bloody knife, which he stuffs in his sock. We learn that mentally, he's a little boy trapped inside a grown man's body. At dinner, when Rose asks for more details, he gives vague workaround answers, clearly hiding something. Of course, I would be too, with Maisie hovering over me like some strange specimen from a natural history museum. Apparently, she's never seen a boy her own age before, so we all have that disaster to look forward to. Mama sees Maisie's fixation and tries to steer things back to prying for more information. Matthew says they were headed to a boat, but claims he can't remember where or why. When she asks where he's from, he lies and says London. Rose has him on the ropes when Jack wakes up and joins them at the table. Table. The fibs fall easier out of his mouth. He says they need to leave tonight, but Rose points out the storm. He pulls out his phone, but Maisie tells him there's no phone, no TV, and no computer here. Rose gets a little defensive. She says this is a working farm and has no need for that. This is the village, cottage core style. I wonder what the monsters will be. As the visitors shuffle off to bed, Jack checks doors and finds them locked. Upstairs, he disembowels the bag Matthew brought with them to find it only contains clothes. He shoves Matthew up against the wall and interrogates him about the real bag, the one with cash inside. Matthew left it in the car. Jack forgives him, but says Matthew won't like what he's forced to do next. Matthew suddenly screams. Maisie and Rose enter to find him pitching a fit. Jack says it's because all of his soothing books and toys are back in the car. Jack tells Rose she needs to help him fetch them, or the tantrum will continue. She refuses to let him and Matthew take the truck. Instead, she says she'll drive them so they can get back for Pa's strict medicine routine. Rose soothes Matthew and takes him away as Jack fixes a picture frame on the wall of Rose with Maisie's deceased brother. Maisie tells Jack that he died when Pa had his accident, but that she can't remember him. Jack puts Matthew to bed and Rose locks Matthew's door. She tells Jack that this is her condition if she's going to go out in the storm to help him retrieve stuff from the car. In the truck, we learned Rose was formerly an anesthesiologist, but gave it up when she lost her son, saying she realized what was important. Is that when the other bodies started to pile up, Rose? At the crash site, Jack does his best to get the bag himself, but his injury and the orientation of the car sends him sprawling in the muck, and Rose discovers one of the secrets the brothers have been hiding. 
Rose tells him she didn't see anything, but Jack pulls a gun anyway. Dude, people die in car crashes all the time. Act sad. Tell her you're just sorry Matthew had to see this when the car crashed. There are a dozen other excuses she'd believe before you ever have to wave a gun in her face. Too late for that, I guess. Back at the house, Maisie lets Matthew out and takes him on a grand tour, even though most of the rooms are locked. She shows him her room and the contraband radio she hides from her mom. In the rain, Jack has Rose. Wait, Jack and Rose? Is that a cursed combination in every timeline? Jack forces her to drive him to the nearest phone. He calls his boss. Turns out the dead body in the car was that guy's son. So naturally, Jack lies about his current aliveness. The boss demands to know where the farm is so he can come get them all and the money. And Jack actually tells him. In the car, Rose notices her toolbox in the back seat. She manages to coax out a screwdriver, but can't hide it in time. Is this for me? I mean, yeah, Jack. Would your eye socket like to hold it for me? Jack warns her nothing she could do with it can compare to what his boss will do when he arrives and finds out his son is dead. So why didn't you give him a different address, you dumb simp? Rose doesn't want you here, and you don't want to be here when your sadistic boss comes looking. So why not lie and disappear into the world a little richer with your spleen unruptured by a mafia executioner? Rose warns that if his boss touches her family, she'll kill Jack. Jack counters that he's the only thing standing between her family and death. You are so full of it, Jackie boy. Literally any other address, and this doesn't happen. Back at the farm, Maisie's radio cut in with a news story about the brothers. They're wanted for theft and murder of a healthcare worker at the institute where Matthew was living. They both panic, but Maisie's able to calm him down. Doesn't work on Jack, though. He barrels in like a rogue chimpanzee. We're talking telenovela levels of unnecessary drama. Jack grabs Rose by the hair and holds Maisie at gunpoint while she unlocks Matthew's door. Jack forces the family into the living room, swearing that if they just sit tight, he'll let them go in the morning. Rose begs Jack twice to let her give Pa his medicine. Jack points his gun at Pa and tells her if she's not back in 60 seconds, he'll wound the man in ways she can't fix. Matthew goes with her, asking what the meds do. She says it's for pain, then comforts Matthew, trying to get on his good side. On her way back, she remembers this is a British movie, and there's a prerequisite Winchester rifle on display in the living room. Headlights splash across the windows. It's too early for Jack's boss. He grabs me Maisie again is leverage, demanding to know who's out there. It's a cop. Jack has Matthew keep Maisie quiet while Rose pretends everything is normal. The cop enters, telling her about the nationwide manhunt. He drew the short straw for coming up into the Highlands to warn the isolated locals. He meets Pa, who seems like he really wishes he could talk right about now. It's an unnatural, uncomfortable atmosphere. He notices three plates on the coffee table and asks who's missing. Rose tells him it's a symbolic gesture for the child they lost. He glances again at Pa's desperate pleading eyes and asks for coffee, the equivalent of a bloodhound sniffing for clues. While Rose goes off to make it, the cop snoops. He pulls the broken picture from the wall of Pa and Maisie. Pa tries to get his attention, but Rose reappears and tells him it's just a spasm. She tries to shoo him away, but the cop knows something is wrong. At the door, he asks for the name of the child she lost. She says his name was Ollie. And who's this. I couldn't place her right away. It's her though, isn't it? It's all anybody talked about that summer. She just disappeared. The family too. Her mother's name was Bella. But that's not you though, is it, Mom? <laughs> Rose rushes away into the house, just as Jack chooses this moment to spring out and shoot the cop. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, Maisie grabs a vase and smashes it over Matthew's head. Holy pandemonium, what are any of you doing? I kinda get knocking Matthew out, but tie him up afterward, Maisie. Jack, you were well hidden. You could've cracked the door and fired while the cop's back was turned. Rose, how did you keep this life going for so long without having a rehearsed excuse at the ready? And you. Detective Dumb. If you find a picture of two missing people on the wall, leave and call in backup. You want a reward for solving the case yourself? Congratulations. Let me pin two lead medals into your chest. Jack and the cop fight, smashing the entry and wrestling for the gun. The cop manages to wrap a tight arm around Jack's neck and knock him out, but. Jesus Christ, it is you. <laughs>
He's no match against the Winchester. Rose walks up to Jack as he wakes. She can so easily kill him, but she knocks him out instead. F why? Was that your only bullet? Pa scrambles to speak to Maisie in the mayhem, but Rose is too quick. She hits him with his medicine and rolls him off, consoling Maisie that she'd never let anyone take her away. Rose drags the men to the basement and chains them to the wall. I hope it's obvious. Just having a wall chain is a continent-sized red flag. She guilts Maisie into helping her stash the cop's body in his own patrol car, but while her back is turned, Maisie steals the cop's phone. She drives the cop's body Body to the car crash and stages it to look like he came across the brothers and they killed him. Pretty solid quick thinking, I must say. Of course, the lack of blood spill should alert someone to the fact that he was dumped there. Not to mention the pool of blood in that patrol car's trunk. Better to burn it all, in my humble opinion. Maisie asks her why she thinks anyone would take her away. Rose rattles off paranoid fears of the world being a cruel place full of vicious people who ruin others. She tells Maisie that when she first held her, she was weak, near death, but with her, she's grown strong. It inspires Maisie to drop the phone she stole so her mother can find it. Yeah, I might have told her the phone could have fallen in the house, giving us a few minutes to play with it before we let Mama find it. After all, Maisie looked old enough in that picture the cop found to know how to work a phone, and a simple phone call would end everything right here. But it's unclear what she heard the cop say. Maisie doesn't no, she doesn't belong here, and without enough suspicion of Mama, or the case the cop was talking about, the phone is simply a tool she doesn't know how to use. At the farm, Jack wakes up in the dungeon and looks for something to break his chain, grabbing a wrench just as Matthew wakes beside him, terrified. Unfortunately, Jack is about as reassuring as a rabid badger. He chokes Matthew until he stops crying, just to make it super clear he's a human skid mark. Jack tells Matthew that if Rose was willing to kill a cop, she's hiding something huge, and they need to escape before she gets rid of them. Buddy, she knocked you out when she could have shot you. I feel like she has way worse plans. Despite his brother's god-awfulness, Matthew reveals the knife hidden in his sock, and Jack uses it to remove the entire block holding them to the wall. He saws through the handcuff link, and they exit through a door leading outside. Matthew wants to just bounce, but of course, Jack refuses. The money's still inside the house, and Matthew Mac, his boss, is coming. He tells Matthew to go to the sheep barn and wait for him, but it devolves again into another terrible big brother lesson about parental neglect and who killed the boss's kid. Hint, it was Matthew. Uh, maybe have this discussion later when two killers are not bearing down on your location. Don't antagonize your only ally. While Matthew loses his shit in the barn, Jack finds himself in Rose's sanctum of psychosis. In an interior room, he finds a sickly blonde woman in bed, missing both her legs, her right hand, and most of the digits on her left. Of course, right beside her is her torturer's wall art collage of newspaper clippings and scratched out family photos. Who is this for again? Oh, right, the audience. And Jack, who reads for 10 seconds and realizes this woman was not only Pa's actual wife and Maisie's mother, but she was also responsible for Rose's son's death. A life for a life, I guess? Correct me if I'm wrong, but scrap booking your criminal activities and keeping the woman you're impersonating alive seems like a swell way to guarantee you go to prison. It gives Maisie a chance to find out the truth, too. This lady should be long buried, is what I'm saying. Maisie's mom has been cut to pieces and left to watch a wall of monitors of Rose living her life, raising her daughter and getting busy with her non-consenting husband, who's been trapped in his body all these years thanks to Rose's bottomless bag of sedatives. She's really subscribed to the whole don't settle for death when suffering is owed motto. The lady wakes up and begs Jack to call the cops, but of course he can't do that. Sure you can, bro. Why are you strolling around this place like it's a museum? You know the girls are out of the house. Pa's incapacitated. You should be sprinting through this house like you're speed running Mario. Grab your money bag and be out the door in like five minutes. Down the road, make an anonymous call. This is not hard. When he says he won't call the cops, the woman asks him to end her suffering. Again, I bet she'll feel
feel differently in a couple of hours after you make that anonymous call and the cops get her to a hospital. Just go. In 10 seconds, it won't matter what you decide to do. Outside, Rose and Maisie arrive at the house to prepare the boys for when their boss shows up. Rose notices something out of place and walks the perimeter to find that Jack has left the basement door wide open. <sighs> Do, do I even need to tell you to cover your tracks better than this? Inside, Jack smothers the woman to death with a pillow, then steals her necklace and a picture of Maisie's whole family from the wall. Honestly, I get that he's gonna tell Maisie about all this, but that implies he's decided to stick around for a while. Why? Money plus brother plus truck and you're gone. Again, an anonymous call to police about Maisie afterward and you're golden. Outside, Rose goes to the barn and finds Matthew hunkered down in the corner. Corner. Because she's been nice to him, he tells her the terrible things Jack said, and with actual sincerity, she tells him she cares about him and will take care of him. You remind me, my Ollie. Maybe we belong together. Just don't ever get her angry, and you'll probably have a mom for life. Back inside. Jack climbs up a dumbwaiter shaft to escape Rose's surgery room, which is odd considering he had to climb up into the house to get here. Maybe wonky geography is the reason this is taking so long. He finds his bag, but the climb tore his stitches open. See, even this movie knows he should be gone already. Talk about contriving a final showdown. He staggers to the kitchen and seals the wound himself. <laughs> The boss arrives in the Highlands just as Maisie enters the house and Jack takes her hostage. He tells her Rose is lying to her and hides in Pa's bedroom as Rose enters with Matthew. Jack tells Maisie the details he's learned, but she refuses to believe him. Yeah, cause it's a lot to process all at once. It takes him way too long to show her the pictures he took. Maybe start with that dip. Jack tells her this is their one chance to escape and sends her to get Pa in the truck by herself somehow while he looks for Matthew. He's forced back inside where Rose uses Matthew as bait. She wants me to stay. Ah! Jack tells her Maisie knows everything. Rose tells him they could all live here together as a family. B you just shot me in the neck. She enters the darkened kitchen and sucker punches her and takes back the gun. He raises the gun to fire, but Matthew shoves the gun aside. He screams that he wants to stay with Mama. We can stay here. Shut the f Matthew chooses Mama, and Maisie runs in to grab Jack. Mama pursues them into the horse stables. Maisie confronts her mom just as Mac arrives outside. Then Jack tells her to run. He draws Mama out into the open and takes cover behind Mac's SUV. But it's just jumping out of the pan into the fire. He lies to Mac, saying she has the money and his son. He drags Jack to his feet, indifferent to the gaping bullet wound in his neck. Mac knows his son died in the car crash. As he passed the car on the way here, he hauls Jack out and shoots him in the leg. Rose steps out to face him. He wants the money and Matthew. She says he can have the money and Jack, but she's keeping Matt. Sounds great to me. Not so much to Mac, who's not content to just get everything he came here for. You ready to die for that? Won't be me that dies today. <laughs> <laughs> Mac's other son steps out and raises his gun to kill Rose, but he's too slow. Matthew impales him with a garden shear from behind. Rose raises her gun to finish him, but she's too slow too, and he knocks her out. Maisie hears the commotion from the car. You crazy fuck! And player six has entered the game. Even better, she just keeps driving. You gotta love it when six killers just knock each other over like dominoes. Anyway, Maisie and Pa are saved. And Rose and Maddie get on with their new life together on a godforsaken spit of land in the far north, along with a newcomer to her sanctum of psychosis. You know what they say, no good deed goes unpunished. Opening the door in the storm is stupid, but it's an understandable stupid. Foolish human empathy mucking up a perfectly good birthday party. It's actually Jack who ruined everything for himself by not just making up an excuse about the dead body in a car crash and hulking out for no reason and for calling his boss in the first place. You had the money. You had your brother. Wait until morning and slither off into hiding a free man. Once Jack gives himself away, there's about a half a dozen places in this twisty turny bullshit.
where a smarter decision would have changed the outcome considerably. On Rose's side, killing Jack was an easy option in the fight with the cop, but it might have been a bit tough to explain to Maisie and Matthew. Instead, I would have tied Jack up, driven him to a field, shot him, buried him, and come back to Matthew with a sob story about how his brother left him. But that still leaves her on the hook for when Max shows up. Rose could have tied both her unconscious bodies up outside with a bag of cash and a sign for Mac that said, take them and go. It's very likely he'd have taken the offer, or just Jack and the cash, if she really wanted to keep Matthew. And by the time Mac got there, she'd be ready with a 12 gauge and a syringe of sedative if she needed it. Once Jack escaped the basement, covering his tracks, scouring the house quickly for the cash, leaving, and anonymously phoning in Rose's crazy sh would have resulted in him and his brother going free with the money. Rose getting arrested, and Pa, his wife, and Maisie eventually being rescued. If you're ever in a situation as warped as this one, have your excuses ready. Remember that anonymous calls to police are absolutely a thing, and try not to tick off your allies. For those reasons, I think Little Bone Lodge was beaten. And remember, when the bullets start flying, don't drag your god feet.